So we're, we're thrilled today to have Edo Aroldi from Harvard University Stats Department. Edo did his uh, undergraduate at Bocconi, and he started in business, but then got into math and stats, and the rest was, was history. So he did his uh, graduate work at, at Carnegie Mellon, and he has published in a bunch of good stuff, JASA Biometrica, Applied Stats, and he's a Sloan Fellow. Is that the, the award? Okay. And uh, without further ado. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and thank you for inviting me to this very distinguished seminar. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you about um, a couple of stories, um, a very recent work. And um, I'm going to start by giving you an overview, especially for the students, um, of deep statistical problems uh, that have to do or that, uh, in the space of network analysis uh, with applications to epidemiology, advertising. I'll try to emphasize advertising. Uh, today, and then um, I'm going to give you a more technical uh, sort of perspective on a couple of these problems, and please stop me at any time if you have questions, okay? So I want to start uh, at a very high level. Um, when I speak to different type of scientists, there's always a lingering doubt about what it is that I'm talking about when I talk about networks, and so I'm going to start with this dichotomy. Okay, on one hand, we have structured observations, and you can think of structure as a network. Okay, so we have network data, measurements on pairs of individuals. Um, and uh, so your observation matrix in that case is an N by N matrix, and the entry tells you about the measurement that has been taken on uh, row I and column J. You can think of them as individuals in Facebook, for example. and uh, you know, that's at one end of the spectrum. So what's at the other end? At the other end of the spectrum, <clears throat> there's other work uh, that always also involves networks, but networks are not observations. These networks are not observed. Uh, instead, these networks are used to explain dependence uh, between high dimensional vectors, okay? So in that case, you can think of graphical models, for example. Um, the data matrix is an N by P matrix where you have N individuals and P covariates or P features on each of these individuals. And they have been usually collected or people posit there will be IID vector valued, P dimensional vector valued observations. And the graph is the result of the inference. It's not uh, what you observe. Um, and so I just want to keep these two perspectives in mind. We are working with network data, okay? And in this talk, <clears throat> I will present a, a couple of situations where the presence of network data in the problem raises some interesting statistical challenges. And the first and main part of the talk will be on how to make valid inference. And by valid, I mean how to obtain intervals, frequentist or Bayesian intervals with uh, uh, a stated um, coverage properties from a non-ignorable sampling design, and I will tell you about what that is. <clears throat> and then I'm going to give you a, a, a minor or you know, final part of the talk on really recent work on how to estimate causal peer influence effects, again, um, on a social network or in the presence of social structure. <clears throat> so to begin with, uh, I'm going to list here a few sources of network data just to make it very concrete about what I'm talking about. So Facebook, uh, you have this big social network. Other social media like Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of effort uh, from the mobile phone industry in leveraging uh, mobile communication networks for better advertising or increasing revenue and so on and so forth. And the data in that particular <clears throat> set of applications is cell phone data. People get to know who calls whom and how much or how long they're on the phone, together with features of the cell phone plans that they work on. And uh, the designs, the ways to collect strategies to collect this network data that are going to be relevant for this talk um, are strategies that are implemented, for example, uh, in, in third world countries. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. And in biology, again, you're going to find a lot of network data. Network data typically 
signaling pathways or metabolic networks are static representation of a dynamic process that happens in the cell. <clears throat> and there's more. OK, so, oops, I'm going backward. All right. So uh, before starting again, I want to say, despite there's a lot of interest uh, recently in this network data, social media platform, and so on and so forth, statistical and other, uh, you know, statistical research and research from other disciplines in, uh, that relates or, or bears relevance to network data um, goes back at least until the 1930s, right? So here I'm listing a few of my favorites, favorite references. Uh, Moreno is the first person who formalizes the sociogram. It's a network where individual nodes are people. It used to be a, a journal sociometry <clears throat> where people pub used to publish network data. And in the 50s, uh, there's a favorite st study of mine, this Coleman uh, et al. in 1957. It's the first model that uh, presents um, the classical diffusion uh, curve. If you're familiar with this S-shaped curve, on the x-axis there's time, on the y-axis there's market penetration, let's say, and there's a lag phase and an exponential penetration phase and then uh, a saturation phase in business. That's exactly where this, this uh, model comes from. And they were studying the diffusion of innovation in the network of physicians in four different cities. Then there's like, uh, you know, mathematics, Erdos Rennie and Gilbert have the random graph model, very popular today. In psychology, Milgram in the 60s was, was doing his small world experiments. And then in the 70s, uh, a lot of this happened at CMU, Carnegie Mellon or Carnegie Mellon related. Holland, Leinhardt, Feinberg, Stanley Wasserman started developing the basis of some of the network models we're still using today. And then in the 90s, <clears throat> I think, uh, there's an interesting paper by three Faluzzo's brothers. That's a Faluzzo's cube paper. Uh, and they were studying uh, the properties of the topology of the, of the routing network underlying the internet, and they found the power law. And then, you know, in physics, uh, power laws became very popular, and, and so on and so forth. So now I'm going to start. I'm going <coughs> to briefly overview some statistical problems uh, that are beyond community detection and power law graphs, which I think are very interesting. <clears throat> so the first problem is representation and compressed sensing. Uh, so do you, can you hear me OK? Yes? All right. So representation and compressed sensing, the idea is you would like or you wish to represent the space of all possible adjacency matrix smoothly. And that's obviously something that cannot happen. We know that now. Uh, but scientists are really interested in understanding the effect of a network in their analysis. And ideally, they would like to be able to dial a parameter from 0 to 1 or from minus infinity to infinity and span all the possible adjacency matrix. Right? And so, um, in statistics, there are several ways of attacking this problem. There's um, spectral representation, semi-parametric model, uh, motif-based representation, metric-based representation. And they're all ways to really get at exploring this space in a principal manner. Um, the second problem is population models. It's very related to the first, uh, to the first problem. And there, um, if you're a scientist or if you're a, st a student and you're interested in statistics, thank you, um, I would point out a couple of issues with existing population models. So first of all, uh, in a lot of papers that deal with network data, at the end of the analysis, you're going to find p-values. Okay? And I'm going to challenge uh, that word. I'm going to, you know, what you're going to find at the end of the paper are going to be some probabilities or the probabilities of some events. They're not really p-values. And you know, the deep statistical issue is what is the notion of variability that's reflected in those probabilities? Right? So if you're familiar with regression, where you have x, y pairs, you have n of them, uh, the p-value is due to replication, you know, encodes variability due to replication. 
Whereas uh, what happens if you have network data, you typically have one network. The same, in the same way in time series analysis, you have one time series. And the, the variability across the network or across the time series, lacking assumptions of, say, stationarity uh, of ergodicity, is not equivalent right, to, to the variability that you get through replicates. And so the notion of variability, if you have one network sample and no replication, is sort of different than the notion of variability you're used to. So that's an important statistical problem to think about. Uh, and the related problem is what is the sample size? So if you have one network, is the sample size one or is the sample size n? And again, you know, you would need some explicit notion of stationarity to get at this, at this issue. And the only paper I'm really fami uh, familiar with in this space is a, is a four-page note by uh, Pavel Krivitsky and Eric Kolacek on ArcSiv. And so that, that's a good starting point um, to think about these issues. So the, the third problem is something I'm going to talk about today, inference from a sample. Sounds simple. And uh, the background here, where we started from, wasn't advertising, was epidemiology. And the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention sponsored more than 90 studies to date and spent millions of, of dollars using one of these link tracing designs, or one of these designs that people, uh, by which people leverage social structure that they can't see to acquire a sample. And you know, the RDS is one of these design is called the respondent driven sampling. So if you, if you acquire the sample with such a strategy, uh, then the question is, well, you know, is this, the statistical question is, is the, sample, the sampling design ignorable? And the answer is no. However, people uh, still do inference assuming that the sample is ignorable. And so I'm gonna you know, dig deeper into this issue and say why, you know, explain why that is wrong and what's the right thing to do and why that would get you invalid or biased inference and so on and so forth. Um, three more problems. So the whole issue about asymptotic analysis uh, of models for network data here is not well, well developed. Um, the first paper who sort of opened the way is a paper by actually Peter Bickel and Ayu Chen uh, in PNAS. And since then, many other people, uh, like Carl Rohi, Binu, uh, Suraf Chatterjee at NYU, uh, Patrick Wolf at, at UCL, David Choi at CMU have been, you know, working out different, different cases. And so that's uh, still a very, um, it's a very small part of what is needed, but at least there's an established thread of literature there you could follow. The next problem is something, again, I'm going to talk about today, is how to do causal inference, or, you know, if you flip the coin, optimal design, if you have social or familiar interference in your sample or in your population. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but just to give you a sense of why this is interesting is if you do causal inference or if you estimate causal effect using the potential outcome framework, the Neyman, Neyman Rubin framework, you have to make an assumption. The assumption is that your treatment is not going to have any effect on anyone else's outcome. That's like the basic assumption. And, uh, and now we're interested in estimating what is the effect of my treatment on somebody else's outcome. So that effect would be zero by assumption in the classical setting, right? And so that's you know, both scary and exciting at the same time, especially if you're a statistician. Um, and then the other problem is how to, to study the diffusion of information on a network or how to make inference on a network for, from trails. Um, and uh, there's some work by Yuri Leskovic and some other people both in Europe and at Caltech in that particular problem that's interesting. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about all of these problems, but if you are interested in any one of them, you should send me an email. I can, you know, get you started with some literature. Okay, so now I'm going to, you know, move into the main part of the talk. I'm going to dive into one of these problems uh, a little bit more in detail, and I'm going to tell you about, you know, how to make inference for non-ignorable sampling designs, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the theory, statistical theory that's useful, some new statistical theory, and then how to actually use the theory to make valid inference. So what are the motivating applications? <clears throat> uh, so like I said, the, the application I personally, um, that introduced me to the problem was in epidemiology. Uh, it was how to survey these hard to reach populations. So you can think of men who have sex with men, 
drug injection users. And uh, the issue is these people don't wear a hat saying I'm a drug injection user. There's no uh, sampling frame that you can use to pick them up at random. And so the strategy scientists that study this problem have devised to reach and, uh, and acquire people into a sample from this population is to leverage social structure. So they could start from a few seeds, a few people who, let's say, were arrested by the police who were while they were injecting drugs, and then give them some coupons that they could give to their drug injection user acquaintances. And if these acquaintances come back and get tested, let's say, for HIV, which is a response scientists care about, then uh, they will get a monetary reward. And so it's sort of like an incentive-based iterative sampling strategy that is leveraging a social structure that you don't know, but the people in your samples actually have access to partially. And you know, if you think about, if you think hard about hard to reach populations, you're gonna find them everywhere, right? So for example, uh, young adults or people in third world countries who are cell phone users only, well, there's no database uh, available to the public uh, about cell phone users or, in, uh, and so you can't really do ra random sample, random sampling from that population. Uh, in healthcare, you can have fathers of people, or fathers of, um, of children with autism, for example, or fathers of children with rare diseases. Again, they don't wear a hat, but you may be interested in advertising a particular drug or in, you know, in, in accessing these people uh, and make them part of a study. Um, but again, the population is hard to reach. And um, this is where the title of my, my talks come from. In, if you do advertising on social media platforms, there's sort of two ways to do it. Uh, the first way is uh, simple. If you're the platform owner, you have access to everyone. You can just uh, you know, look at people features, people characteristics, and present them ads the way uh, you're used to. Uh, but if you don't, if you, let's say, write an app that works on Facebook and you're interested in estimating the proportion of uh, people between the age of 18 and 25 who may be interested in a new product your company is going to be marketing, well, then you're going to only have access to the people who use your app. But you could encourage them to ask their friends who are also possibly interested in the product to join the app to get discounts. And so you know the same sort of design works. So just to be uh, very clear, you know, all these situations they have in common the fact that you want to leverage existing social structure that you don't have access to to sample from a population. And members of the population have a partial view of the social structure. And responding to and sampling is just one of these uh, strategies. They're usually called network sampling designs or link tracing sampling designs. And here is how it works. So in this PDF slides, I don't have um, an animation, but you can imagine we'll start from the top, from the blue node at the top right. That's my first seed. I'm going to give him two coupons. And he, so first of all, I should say, this network that you see is the social structure I don't have access to. As a, as a survey, you know, as a person who wants to administer a survey, the only thing I have access to is uh, that blue seed. I know he's a member of the population I care about. So I give him two coupons and I ask him to give it to his friends who um, are also part of my target population. And he only gives out one to this second person. Then I also give him two coupons and he only gives out one. And I also give to the third person two coupons and he doesn't give out any coupon. So at that point, I have a sample of size three. I'm not satisfied, I want a larger sample size. So through some other means, I am able to recruit this red person. And again, through the same mechanism, I'm going to, to eventually end up with a sample of size six. That's what I care about, I'm happy. So this is not snowball sampling. So Goodman in 1961 uh, developed such a, uh, an idea for sampling hard to reach populations. In snowball sampling, once you have access to, let's say, the first blue seed, you automatically have access to all the people in his neighborhood, so to these other four people. Whereas here, I need some incentive-based mechanism to be able to recruit these people and to, to get access to them. Okay? So there's, a, there's an important difference there. That would be the source of the statistical issue. So what's the theory? Well, I'm going to you know, present you here two slides. First, I'm going to tell you what's the classical inferential framework. Um, and then 
I'm going to tell you about what is the augmented inferential framework uh, that we should use and why this is inadequate. Okay? So here, why is the response? You can think of uh, how much time people between 20 and 25 spend online playing a particular game, or you can think of why as yes or no, the particular person has HIV. I is a random variable that is the sampling design. And once you, you decide on your design, so you have a, an instantiation of your design, let's say small lowercase i, you can split the response into the responses that are included, the responses that are excluded. Okay? Just to be very clear, this y, if you have a population of n people, y is a vector, it's an n-dimensional vector. And again, i is an is a n-dimensional vector of zeros and one that tells you who's included and who is excluded. R is a missing data mechanism. It's there. Um, you can ignore it for the time being because we're not going to really hammer on it. But the missing data mechanism will work on the people you included in your sample because somebody will actually respond and will be part of Y observed. And somebody will decline to respond. And so he, will be, he or she will be Y missing. Okay? And so part of the data that's missing, that's not observed, is uh, either those responses that were excluded by design or ex responses that were included by design but they were missing because the people uh, declined to, to participate. And then in this classical inferential framework, we have X. X are pre-sampling covariates. They are fully observed, and that's really the key. Okay? And this pre-sampling covariates, you can think of a voter registration list, a phone book, any set of covariates that you can use to decide uh, and, and and sort of to, to, to implement your design. Okay, and then you know, here we want to make inference on some quantity y, so, uh, sorry, some quantity q that's a function of both the observables, okay, so y and x. And so now I can tell you about what is an ignorable sampling design. Intuitively, an ignorable sampling design, <coughs> a design is a design um, for which the responses that you don't see don't have any information about the quantity that you want to estimate, okay? So if you get a sample from a non-ignorable sampling design, you can just make likelihood-based inference or valid inference uh, based on the sample you obtain. You don't need to model the process, right? You don't need to model the design because it's ignorable. You just, okay, so technically, I think this is perhaps the most, the bottom one is the most interesting equation. It tells you that the distribution of i, this random variable that implements, that, that, this, that specifies your sampling design, is just a distribution on this 0, 1 vector, <coughs> conditional on you know, fully observed pre-sampling covariate response and uh, missing data mechanism, is just a function of the observed responses, y ox. Okay? So this is all good. Now, you know, what is the challenge when you try to apply this framework to, um, to the situation I told you about where you have a network in the mix and you're leveraging social structure to, to access your sample? So what is the role of the graph? In the classical inferential framework, is not there, okay? And if you think hard enough about the graph, well, the graph can be thought about giving you information post-sampling, right, because you can access local structure of person I only after he or she is in your sample. Right? So it's definitely a post-sampling covariate. And it's, only, it's also partially observed, right? So that's a key difference from snowball sampling, the Goodman framework. But the point is, you can think of G as being post-sampling covariates with missingness. And so we, in the next slide, I'm going to reformulate briefly this inferential framework by using x as a function of g. And now these x are no longer pre-sampling covariates fully observed, are these post-sampling covariates that are missing. And so now this richer or different notion of ignorability we can use, it's very simple to state. It's exactly like the one it was before. So here you have the probability of your sampling design. <coughs> So a sampling design is ignorable if its distribution only depends on the part of the graph that you see and on the responses that you see. So now I'm going to spend a couple of slides you know, fleshing out this random variable i just to give you some clear intuition of what it is. 
So here in the classical, so here I have in gray, I hope you all can see the gray nodes and the gray edges. That's a social structure I cannot observe, okay? And here uh, in panel A, um, I'm showing some black dots and some gray dots, okay? So that's a representation of my random, of the support of my random variable sampling design in the classical framework, right? It's just the vectors of zero and one. So each node here is an entry in the vector i. If it's gray, there's a zero. In if, uh, if there's a one, right? If it's black, there's a one. So now here uh, in panel B, I have this richer design random variable. The reason why I say it's richer is because the support has now two pieces, right? As before, you have a, an n-dimensional vectors with zeros and one, depending on whether each person is included or excluded. And then you also have an adjacency matrix. Uh, and you know, in this adjacency matrix, um, you only observe the black edges, right? So now the, the sampling design, this random variable, is no longer a vector. It's a vector plus an adjacency matrix. And now here, I can show you, you know, intuitively, when the design as a random variable is ignorable. So let's see. If, uh, if you look at this person here, right, this guy over here, uh, you will, you, first of all, you will notice that in panel C and D, I have the same observed network. Okay, so if you look at the configuration of black dots and black edges, it's exactly the same. And the question at issue is, what is the distribution of, or what is the probability of this observed design, you know, the vector of 0 and 1 and the, and the observed adjacency matrix, in these two situations? If it's the same, then the sampling design is ignorable. If it's not the same, okay, then the sampling design is not ignorable. And you will notice that here, uh, the only thing that changes is that the social structure between panel C and D is changing, right? So what I'm saying is, again, what I said before is, if the probability of my observed design or eventually of my responses is independent of the portion of the network that I don't see, that's an ignorable sampling design. But here, the, the portion of the network I, know, I don't see is different, right? So if the probability of the observed design and the responses is now a function of the network that I don't see, of the portion of that I see, then we have a non-ignorable sampling design. And that has um, some important consequences. But before moving on, um, I'm going to give you some, some remarks to sort of um, help you feel in, uh, feel comfortable with this new notion. Yes? The, the previous line, so it's necessary for it to be ignorable in the earlier the definition for the probability of, the, of both the observed responses and the graph to be free of dependence on the missing nodes and edges. I'm going to get at that with the surveys. The, the issue is the two notions of ignorability apply to two different settings, right? In the classical version, so, but let me get, that's exactly, I'm not going to answer the question right now. And if I don't, you can tell me, OK? But that's exactly the issue. So, so Guido was uh, asking me about, you know, call it bullet point number two. And the thing is, the standard notion of ignorability I presented you before, and this notion applied to two different settings. They can never coexist. You either have pre-sampling covariates that are fully observed, or you have post-sampling covariates that are partially observed. And so if you have, you know, depending on which one you have, as soon as you have post-sampling covariates that could be missing, then you need the new notion. Now, now the next question is, uh, well, can I talk about graph ignorability versus response ignorability? And the, the answer to the question is no, with a caveat. So if uh, the posterior distribution, sorry, if um, the missing responses and the missing edges or nodes in the graph are a posteriori independent, then you could talk about um, you know, graph ignorable and, and response ignorable as two separate properties just because that definition factors. The definition is a definition of design given the data. Uh, however, people use this um, 
link tracing sampling design to leverage such a structure when they believe that the covariate, which is the graph, right, imposes a dependent structure on the responses. So that's a really a something that we don't expect to happen in practice. But you know, there's, there is this caveat that if that were to happen for a particular model. And, so, and, and here is probably the, the culprit of all of this you know, complexity is that the graph is playing a dual role here. The graph is both used to specify the design and is also uh, in, induces a dependent structure on the responses. And that's also why, one reason why if, you, if you're familiar with um, missing data literature, sometimes people will say, well, you know, if you have two different sets of responses, you can just notation-wise put them together in this new vector Y tilde and apply the classical notion of ignorability there. Well, the, here you can't do that because the graph plays in this dual role, and so you wouldn't have uh, a well-behaved object to, to work with. So this is just us trying to convince ourselves that the definition uh, that we came up with is beyond just notation. And you know, in this problem, it's actually, it appears to be real. And um, so what, you know, why do we need it? Well, so now we can go back through the literature and look at some popular sampling designs that people are using in practice and decide you know, whether they are ignorable or not ignorable. And so one, one thing I would say is very important about ignorability in general, it's not an assumption that you are allowed to make. It's a, it's, a, it's a property of the model and the design that you're using. And so if you have the design and if you have a model, well, just check that, that, that condition I gave you and you will know whether it's ignorable or not. If it's ignorable, you're fine. If not, you have to work harder to make inference. Okay? And so uh, in the literature, as you can imagine, you will find everything. Uh, but now, you know, we can, we can get some clarity and, and be happy about it. And so, for example, uh, snowball sampling here is ignorable. So, uh, obviously, Goodman has a good appreciation of statistics. It's not uh, surprising uh, that he, he's drawing the right conclusions. Uh, egocentric sampling design, so a sampling design where you pick a person and you explore all of his neighborhood is also ignorable. And that is comforting because that's equivalent to simple random sampling. And then incomplete egocentric designs where you pick a person only a subset of the people or responding driven sampling are actually not ignorable. And in a slide I will show you in a, in a particular study what is the type of effects you can expect if you make, if you assume a sampling design is ignorable when it is actually not. Another surprising, for me at least, uh, um, finding was that if you have a fixed population size, or if you have a random population size, that changes nothing, typically, about the ignorability versus not ignorability of your sampling design, which I was surprised about. So now I'm going to switch gears and just tell you, you know, what it is that you should be doing. Uh, or actually, I'm going to tell you one possible solution to this problem, I should say. Uh, so currently, people are using this popular Horowitz-Thompson estimation uh, estimators for basically what you do, you have a sample, you have either a model-based approach or an algorithmic approach to estimate inclusion probabilities, probability that each individual is included in the sample, and then you just, instead of doing an average or a sum, which is what these Horowitz-Thompson estimators are, are, are useful for, you just do a weighted average or a weighted sum. And uh, <clears throat> so the results that I'm not really telling you about here, so, but you can find in the paper that I, can, I could email you if you were interested, suggest that to do valid inference, to, do inf to, do, to find these Bayesian intervals with, let's say, uh, stated frequentist coverage, what you need to do, you need to augment the sample by not only imputing edges, which essentially uh, all these algorithm and, and model-based approaches to estimate inclusion probabilities are doing, either explicitly or not, but you have to imp impute both edges and nodes, okay? And so that is a, a substantial departure because now, uh, you know, you have a model space, a parametric space that is changing in dimension and so include, you know, um, generate some complexity that are uh, of interest mostly to statisticians, but we can deal with, okay? And so, now, 
what you know if I zoom out of, of all the theory what are the key elements that you need to to be able to do valid inference from a non-ignorable sampling design so there's three elements <clears throat> so this is the common element to all uh, that you need to to specify um, for all models you have a, you have a model for the response given the graph okay and so if you have a model for the response given the graph, then uh, you can already, if, if your sampling design is ignorable, you can do likelihood-based inference on Q, this quantity. Okay, so, but if you do have a non-ignorable sampling design, you have to add two pieces. The first, the most important piece here is P of I given G. So you have to have a model for what the design that you are actually implementing is doing as a function of the graph. That is, arguably something that on a case-by-case -case basis you can, you can specify pretty well because you're implementing a design, so you should know what it does. Okay, and there may be, there may be issues here, but at, in principle you should at least get a rough, a, a, model, a, you know, a rough model in the right ballpark for what the design is doing. And then here, which is the most problematic part, is you have to have a model for the graph because in order to impute edges, and input nodes, in particular, you need to know something about you know, average degree or things like that. And so that is really important. And, and you know, obviously, if you fail to specify uh, properties of the graphs badly, you can expect not to get nominal coverage. And so where, where the access fill in, the access that you only observe and you actually see the nodes? So you have to specify the graph. Um, so I made a switch of notation. So let me clarify the first. So the, this graph, you know, you can think of the graph as the axis, okay. right? Because the axis were a deterministic function of the graph. So I think, yes, you're exactly right. All right, so if I specify a model for the graph for the design for the response, then, you know, then everything else goes through it. You can expect, barring some corner cases, some good coverage. So here, um, I'm going to tell you about an experiment that we've done uh, in, in advertising. And so we were looking for a proportion of users that were interested in, in, in a particular product. And in this particular case, we had access to population data. So we knew that in this particular age bracket, there was about 79% you know, of, of the, the target population was actually using uh, this app. And so but what we did, since we had access to the population, we just pretended that we didn't, and we simulated sampling tracing designs, and then applied different uh, types of estimates to see you know, what the answer that we would get. And here, I'm just gonna talk about this Horvitz-Thompson-based estimator here, and uh, you know, the Bayesian estimator on the right. And I guess the qualitative picture, which we convince ourselves is something that happens in most cases that we've tried, is that the Horvitz-Thompson estimator is going to be biased and it's going to be underestimating the variance. So if you looked at the estimates that the Horvitz-Thompson estimator gives you, you know, you'd be pretty confident about the wrong number, okay, the wrong proportion of users, which, you know, here was from 79 to about 64%. If uh, you do model the graph and you do model the design, then you know, the good news is that you get an estimate that is much less biased. In fact, you know, I would... <coughs> I would say is a pretty good estimate, okay? Uh, however, the variability of your estimate is increasing. And that's it, 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 you know, a, more, a fairer description, actually, of the variability, because now you're taking into account the variability of the response, the variability of the design, and the variability of the graph. So you can expect your estimates to be more variable, but they're also better. And if you do you know, coverage studies, you will find that the coverage is about uh, the nominal coverage. Okay. so. That's all I wanted to say about this uh, first piece. And now I'm going to have only three slides about the second story, but you know, there, there, there are new results, and I think it's a, it's a good problem and interesting enough to at least pose the problem. Uh, OK, so now the, the question is, um, you know, why, why do you sample networks? Well, you know, or now you're interested in doing an experiment on a network. 
Okay. So you want to do an experiment on a network and a two motivating application. For the first application was, uh, for example, for the Obama for America campaign, we ran uh, some experiments, and the goal was to increase uh, donations, incre increase uh, volunteering turnout, and increase um, um, you know voter voters turnout. Okay, and so in the way that we run this experiment. Uh, we try to leverage peer pressure and social influence okay. to, to get this increase. And so in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to quantify what the effect is before we can leverage it. Right? Or at least after the experiment, we need to decide whether there was an effect of peer influence and how much that was. And, and if you can translate that directly into the advertising arena, you may want to migrate cons consumers from offline to online. So if you have... Um, you know, if, you're, if you are a grocery store, like a large chain, and you have people who are members of your loyalty program offline, so they have this card that they swipe in store, and now you have an app on Facebook or you have a, um, a website where you can actually both track consumers better, um, get more of the information, and, um, and serve them better ads, right? then what, what you want to do, you want to migrate your consumer base from offline to online. And this is a particular, particularly useful, peer influence has been particularly useful, or is believed to be particularly useful when you're trying to, to market new products. Like 90, 95% of the new products will fail, but if you had a friend recommend you a new brand of a specific product that you're using, let's say diapers of brand A versus B, it costs about the same, why not to make, give it a try, right? And, uh, and then, you know, other, there's other, uses for this uh, social influence. OK, so you know, what we did in, in, in three slides. So first of all, the literature um, is a little bit vague. And in fact, uh, I would say even non-existent on what would you do if you ha had access to, social, to a social information. And so typically, and especially these two papers by Rosenbaum and Hodges and Halloran and Jaza, um, they are dealing with interference. They are dealing with social interference. Um, but they're still estimating average causal effect. Or if, if they try to adjust average causal effect for interference, um, they do it in a very generic way without, any, without taking advantage of any social information. And so if we wanted to actually leverage social information, what we need to do, we need to define a new family of estimates. And in the paper, we have different families of estimates here. I just want to give you, you know, a, a taste for what these estimates look like. Well, first of all, the potential outcome for person I is now no longer a function of the treatment to person I only. It's also a function of the treatment of others. And in particular case, we, in this particular case, we chose uh, the potential outcome to be a function of person I treatment and the treatment of the people connected to person I using this social information. And so now here, I'm looking at this difference. And this difference is telling me, well, what's the outcome? What's the re response of person I if he didn't get the treatment, but somebody in his neighborhood did get the treatment, minus the response of the same person if he still didn't get the treatment, and no one in his neighborhood took the treatment. So that's essentially what, what the families, these families of estimates are doing. And then you, know, you could have estimates, like in this case, where I'm averaging over all possible assignments of K, treat K treatments, yeah. of treatment to K neighbor of this person, right? So you have this person, and you're considering all the possible assignments where K of his or her neighbors are treated, and then you're just averaging you know, by 1 over Ni chose K, which is the number of the neighbors of person I and K, uh, K people treated. And then you're averaging here over VK. And VK is just a set of people that are eligible for being treated. And the person who are eligible in this case are people who have at least K neighbors, right? Because I'm assigning to, at, to exactly K, K, K of personized neighbor uh, a treatment. And so you can imagine other estimates. This is at a K level effect you could have a certain percentage um, 
of the people in one's neighborhood treated, or you could have, you could treat um, specific neighbors depending on their covariates. So, you know, in some corporate setting, you could imagine that uh, the boss or the senior person has more influence, and so you create a randomization or an estimate that tries to get at that influence. And so, if you do that, then there's a couple of things that change. Well, first of all, um, if you do randomization based inference and you, you pick the simplest possible estimator you can think of, now the set of all possible randomization is constrained because for some randomizations, you just won't be able to compute an estimate. And so in this particular case I'm showing here, I have these two people who are eligible, so only two. Uh, they have eight neighborhood, and here what I'm doing, I'm putting in red people who are receiving no treatment and in green people who are receiving treatment. So in this particular case, uh, I'm assigning control to all the shared neighbors, and then I'm picking four people in the neighborhood of, of this node and assigning them treatment, and I'm assigning control to everyone in the neighborhood of this other person. And so in this case, I would have, I would be able to compute that difference because here I have uh, four people treated in this neighborhood, and here I have zero people treated in this neighborhood. But you know, this is sort of the intuition behind why you would have to constrain randomizations. And then, you know, if you go one step beyond and do and try to understand how social structure affect, um, for example, the number of available randomizations here, there's a function, there's a there's a number called the sharing index that essentially is quantifying how locally dense and network is, and, and you know, as you can expect, uh, the denser locally the network is, the more constrained the space of all possible randomization is going to be. And then, yes, if you do this randomized randomization based inference without any modeling assumption, what's going to happen is that you're going to introduce bias, and the bias is going to be proportional to how many randomizations you're excluding, therefore, it's proportional to the sharing index. Because the, the more locally dense the, the, the network is, the more randomization you have to be excluding. However, if you were to assume additive treatment effects, for example, then you know this uh, you would get rid of the bias. And so there's some. If you're familiar with um, the potential outcome framework, even in the classical framework, adding additivity solves some problems. Here, here assuming additivity solves a different sort of, of problems. So. I'm, that's all I wanted to say, you know, to just give you a taste about uh, uh, this, this second problem, and I can share a preprint with anyone who is interested. Uh, so what I might take on point, well, I guess the, the larger point I was trying to make is that um, as soon as you have a problem where network data uh, is involved, well, a lot of the classical notions of statistics gets challenged somehow, okay? And I, I showed you six problems when, where that actually happens. And then I told you about how to, one way to make inference from uh, network sampling designs, and here the key notion is this statistical notion of non-ignorability where you have, where you have post-sampling covariates that are partially observed. And then I, I sort of give you a hint about uh, one strategy to estimate causal effect in the presence of social in interference. And in there, <clears throat> you know, the, the statistical elements that come out to be interesting is you have new estimates, you have constraint randomizations, and you can actually draw some, some conclusions. And I just wanna finish by thanking a number of people who have provided data input or, or support. Uh, and here are people at the CDC, Myron Katzov at Facebook, um, Cameron Marlowe, Jonathan Chang, and Dean Eccles more recently. Um, people in Nanigans, that's a firm that does advertising on social media platforms, and Raid Ghani at uh, Obama for America. And I have you know, here a couple of, of preprints that if you were interested in, at this stage we're really looking forward to comments by everyone who has any interest. And thank you very much.
can you say anything about how you would actually do inference given the experiments you described? So you, you talked about how you would do the design. Uh, so the, yeah, so I, I, I skipped, that, uh, that, that the I only had one slide about that and so, but the way to do it, or the way we do it is, well, first of all, you posit a model for the response, a model for the design, a model for the graph, and then, um, you know, you write down the posterior distribution of this <coughs> uh, for the latent variable, so missing responses and, and the missing nodes and edges, and you impute them, and then once you impute them, you have all the y's and all the x's, and you can compute q. So essentially, it's just a, you know, imputation of the missing responses and the missing part of the network, and then you can compute this function q that's your estimate in that particular setting. But so, so also for the experiments you described at the end, would you do essentially the same there? Um, no. So. Uh, Maybe I wasn't clear enough. I think these two pieces of of uh, the two the two stories I talked about are separate for now. We don't really know. So, so when you do these experiments, you describe. So you have you have access to the social information. So you start off. You have access to the social information. Yeah, yeah. Then how do you model the outcomes? Uh, the oh, I see. Outcomes? Well, you know, you you have two two ways to do it, right? So you either do randomization based inference, so you have this estimate and uh, you have an estimator for it, and right? Uh, you do it that way, or we also have a linear model because the outcomes that we have are like positive reals, and so in that particular case, but, but I think, um, um, yeah, so that's what we do. But you know, I think inference in that particular part of the talk is not, it's nothing new, it's just, standard inference. It's like well, what was surprising to me at least and was um, that you now have to, you know, in order to get an estimate you need to constrain the set of randomizations and the set of, you know, how many randomizations you're going to have to discard is a function of how locally dense your graph is, but that induces some bias, right? And then if you do this additive, additive treatment assumption, you get rid of the bias. If you do the linear model assumption, it's the same, right? So, so yeah, inference is uh, standard. What if um, you had a design that's sort of in the middle? Um, some designs have really been done. So um, <coughs> say I want to, I'm interested in the network effects and say it's get out the vote. Uh, say I have three arms. Uh, one. I just uh, randomly sample just one person. I go knock on their door, and then I go see if they turn out. Another arm, and the arms are geographically separated out, mm -hmm. so give me the no interference assumption across arms. Mm -hmm. The second arm, I knock on your door, but I also randomly pull some, one of your neighbors as well, or two of your neighbors, mm -hmm. doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the third one, uh, say I like saturate, Yep. your block. Um, in these designs, I don't know the, the network, uh, but I have some features of the network, right? Um, so in this kind of thing, how would you do inference? I don't know. So I think the situation you're describing is in between Hodges and Halloran, where they have this idea of saturation, right? But they don't have any control over the social structure, but you do, at least in two of your arms, right? And so I, I don't really know. But I think that is in the middle, and maybe taking lessons from what we're doing and what they're doing and combining somehow. But I, it sounds complicated, just because the estimate is going to be complicated. Yeah, a good question. My question is quite similar to the previous one. <coughs> Uh, my question is quite similar to the previous one. Like, when, uh, it is about the second portion of the talk. So when you have some kind of randomized experiment on the network, 
So how you pull all the information, even if you are given a network? Mm -hmm. So say the treatments, the effect, treatment effect of all the neighbors might not be same, or there might be some kind of more design issues lying there. Like there, it's or how do you take the treatment effects into picture? Do you take a majority vote or do you take some kind of other structures? So in these kind of situations, it's it, uh, how you design this problem, it becomes different. Mm -hmm. So did you take into account this kind of uh, like variabilities or, or these <coughs> are like model issues that you can take into account later on? OK, so you know, the answer is, Mostly, I don't know, but I'll give you some, i share some of my thoughts. So the theory that we developed is just for this particular estimate that I showed you, where I am considered to be treated if you treat either a K of my neighbors or if you treat a portion of my neighbors, right? And so these results are very specific to that estimate. The other estimate we are considering, for which we, have, we don't have really result, but at least we're looking at it, is um, Another family of estimates I mentioned where you select the neighbors depending on their covariate. So, you know, their seniority or like age or you know, income or whatever, and then you are stratifying or you sort of you are selecting, you know, the, the people that you're treating um, as a function of this covariate. So, I guess <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is the solution that we're taking to estimating causal effect with interference, right, is by assuming essentially a channel through which interference happens. So we're very explicit about how interference happens. So you have to believe that assumption. If that works, right, then you know I'm I would wager that some version of this theory is going to follow. Okay. So if um, if you have a very complicated um, uh, situation, my suggestion would be as long as they're very explicit about how interference happens in your situation, you may have a chance to you know, set the right estimates and then take it from there and see what happens, right? Uh, but but uh, uh, that's what we're doing. There's no magic. We're just you know, stating the assumptions clearly and working from there. So. Uh, uh. On, I get a question on the Horvitz Thompson thing, uh, but more in your second case. So, say I know the network, um, I, I know the assignment mechanism, um, and then say I'm willing to make, say, like a Markovian process that in this network, if I treat my neighbor, there's some effect exposure on me, but one step out, mm -hmm. it's zero. Uh, so, then I uh, do the Horvitz Thompson thing on that. Uh, not on the assignment probability, but the exposure mm -hmm. probability. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've buried everything in that exposure model now, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. what if it's not Markovian? Yeah. Um, if I do that, um, uh, is inference straightforward? Um, well, I would say two things. So there's a paper slash non-paper by uh, Sami and Aronov where they do something yeah. similar to what you're saying. They have an exposure model. Everything is buried in there. And then if you could compute those exposure probabilities, then you can use Orbit Thompson, right? Yeah. And I think what's, when you bury things in this exposure model, two things may go wrong, right? So the first thing is that you actually can't compute the exposure probability because your design is too complicated. But assuming that you can, now if you have a large network, a lot of these probabilities are going to be zeros, right? And so Orbit Thompson estimator is going to blow up anyway. And so I, I would refrain from doing that. But, and that's why we, we looked at it and we decided we'll do something else. Is, does that paper have the best variance test? Because their variance estimate is pretty bad. Um, is there a better bound on it or is that the? So, you know, the only two, so we're also trying to compute variance estimates, which is non-trivial. So we don't have an answer. I mean, numerically we can, but not analytically. So the only two cases is, well, if you do, uh, some, if you take Sami and Aronov approach, well, then you have an orbit Thompson estimator, you get that estimate. Right? So, but that, that's a formula, but empirically it can still blow up and it will blow up. Right? And so the other approach is a paper by Jonathan Ugander and John Kleinberg. So there are some 
uh, there are computer scientists at Cornell, <coughs> and they have a cluster-based randomization strategy, and uh, they have similar estimates to the ones we are showing here. They are not excluding randomization, so things may still blow up, but they do have um, a recursive formula to compute a variance estimate, you know, in in very simple situation. So you know if your model if your network is a ring, if your network is a ring, and then inf influence comes from you know at most two of your neighbors, one to the right, one to the left, then they have a recursive formula, they can do it. But so you know the, the real answer is uh, variance is an open problem. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If you have an answer you should <laughs> I'd love to know. <laughs> Yes. In the first part, uh, when you are considering uh, sampling, desi uh, sampling designs, in that case, when you considered network models, was it specific to some kind of network models, or was it a general network model that you considered? Means in the third part of Bayesian, when you consider the Bayesian. No, so I mean, the, so there are some calculations to perform inference that will become very complicated if you have the complicated network models. So in our paper, we're looking at block models, we're looking at random graphs. We thought about doing for latent space model, but we didn't do the calculation. Right, so there I am burying some details. And so you know, the, the framework and the validity, you, you still have it, but you may, may not be able to do an efficient or a computationally feasible sampler. Um, I think. Am I answering your question? You were asking about that. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Good questions. It's like Basus Prana, you know, you're going to have an estimate depends on one data point.